Hey, it's Ben Greenfield. Does it annoy you when I chew gum like this? Uh, I'm chewing mastic gum. I don't know if you ever heard of mastic gum. When I interviewed this guy who ran a ultra marathon across Greece, Dean Karnazes, he told me how he chewed this Grecian gum called mastic gum to keep his saliva flowing. Turns out it also strengthens your jaw. The only reason I have a nice square jawline, honestly, is because I, I chew mastic gum. It has nothing to do with parenting or genetics or anything like that. I just chew this gum. It tastes like ass, but uh, it, it does the trick. It's very functional gum. Anyways, uh, today's podcast is with a guy named Stephen Cabral, who wrote one of the most intriguing books on, on uh, ancient Ayurvedic techniques for detoxifying and caring for the body. Uh, that I've ever read. So I had a lot of little things circled and highlighted and pages folded over in the book after I read it. So I decided to get him on the show and interview him about what he does and how he discovered these techniques. And we get into the practical nitty gritty uh, topics about how you can detox yourself. Speaking of detoxing, why not do a coffee enema? That's right. You can do a coffee enema with the key on coffee. Uh, it's completely pure. So it's guilt-free coffee. You can shoot up your butt. Uh, or if you're a normal person who just likes to drink an amazing tasting cup of coffee in the morning, uh, coffee that is completely free of mold and okra toxins, but has also been tested against 40 plus other coffees on the market, including a bunch of healthy brands that you're probably aware of, and blown those brands out of the water, in some cases over four times the amount of antioxidants in those coffees, uh, you need to try Keon Coffee. It is the purest and the freshest coffee that you can drink. It, I mean, the crema on this stuff alone, even my French press has like a one-inch crema on it. Espresso, it's, it's mind-blowing how much of a difference this coffee makes when you pull a shot of espresso. So if you have not yet tried Keon Coffee, I don't know what's wrong with you. You need to try it. So you can go to getkeon, that's getkion.com slash coffee and give this stuff a go. That's getkeon.com slash coffee. Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by a very interesting supplement that especially if you have gas or bloating or constipation is going to be right up your alley. Uh, what this company Atrantil has done is they've loaded up this capsule with polyphenols from peppermint and from horse chestnut, and also a special kind of root. And they've created this blend that sops up and soaks up methane that is produced in your digestive tract by bacteria. They've shown that not only can it improve your recovery from exercise-induced muscle damage when you get the polyphenols that are in this blend, but it, it is one of the best ways when you eat a big meal to keep yourself from farting. It's also, if you have something like small intestine bacterial overgrowth, amazing for that. Also for leaky gut issues, for IBS, for bloating. It was developed by a gastroenterologist in Texas. I'm going to get him on the podcast soon, actually, because uh, he's such a wealth of knowledge on all things gut. But when it comes to something that you can pop before a meal uh, to get rid of bloating and to fix constipation, uh, this is this is one of the best things I've found. And here's a cool thing. They back it by 100% money back guarantee. Uh, you can't get that type of guarantee from a prescription or any other remedy. And they use this thing called cabracho, meaning it's a macro molecule. That means it doesn't get absorbed and cause any side effects. It stays in the small bowel. It does its job right there. And then it's also used by your microbiome as a prebiotic. How nifty is that? I bet you didn't know that you needed a prebiotic for your microbiome. Or maybe you did. Either way. This is the best way to get it. So here's the URL. It's a great URL. Lovemytummy.com slash Ben. That's lovemytummy.com slash Ben. And you can use code Ben at the checkout. That'll get you 15% off. Code Ben at checkout. I'll put a link in the show notes as well. So enjoy your, your quebracho in your Atron Till supplement. In this episode of the Ben Group from Fitness Show... You are absolutely doing more harm than good if you go in a steam room that you don't know where the water's been filtered because the chlorine is now a vapor. And that vapor just goes directly through the lungs right into your bloodstream. So I can't recommend that at all. This is my thought philosophy. I'm gonna practice medicine. 
but I'm only going to practice the form of medicine that gets people better. Everybody believes their form of medicine is the best in the world, right? Like who's a health practitioner who doesn't say it's the best in the world? Of course it is. So here's the deal though. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power, speed, mobility, balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there when you look at all the studies done. The studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. I'm back. Of course I'm back. Uh, I read so many freaking books, I have to come back because I, I hunt down these amazing authors, and today's guest is no exception. Uh, he wrote this book. Uh, it's called The Rain Barrel Effect, How a 6,000-Year-Old Secret Yes, 6,000. Holds the answer to finally getting well, losing weight, and feeling alive again. Uh, his name is Dr. Stephen Cabral, and he's a, he's a naturopathic doctor. Uh, he has this place called the Cabral Wellness Institute. When he was 17, he had the, this horrible illness, and he traveled around the world figuring out how to fix it. And then he wrote a book about it, and he called the book Rain, Rain Barrel Effect. And it's, it's a good book. I actually was playing around with the little detox protocol he filled me in on in the book uh, just yesterday. And I felt amazing, and my wife was laughing at me because it involved a coffee enema. And I will, I will uh, let Stephen explain later on in today's show. Um, so, Stephen, uh, or should I say, Doctor Cabral, or is it Cabral? It's Cabral, and I think uh, Stephen Cabral. Any, any of those that work for me, so don't don't worry about it. So you wrote this book, uh, but uh, but I want to, of course, press the rewind button. Uh, but before I do, where where is your institute? It's Boston, Massachusetts is where I'm out of. Okay, cool. So basically as far away in the U.S. as you can get from me. So Yeah, I don't think it could be further, exactly. Most likely never visit you. Uh, no, the last time I was in Boston, it was like 38 degrees below zero. So it is kind of unlikely that I'll go back. Painful. There's only a few months. No, the, if you go in the late, we'll, we'll just put it this way. If you go late to early fall, beautiful, and then forget about the rest of the time. Yeah. No, no that, need to come visit that time. That, that pretty much describes the way I felt when I was there. So uh, so you wrote this book. Uh, tell me about what happened when you were 17. So, and that was one of the things too, is there was never an intention growing up in Medford, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Boston, to ever, I mean, at growing up there, you don't even know what a naturopathic doctor is or functional medicine. And this is, you know, 20, a little over 20 years ago. But what happened was, I literally woke up one day, normal 17-year-old high school student, and when I went to get out of bed, I like literally immediately knew something was very wrong. It was one of those times where you're just like, this is not a normal cold. All the lip nodes in my body are swollen, I mean like golf ball size, no exaggeration. My neck, my wow. groin, my armpits, my eyes are crusted together, my tongue swollen, and I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to go downstairs, tell my mom there's no way I'm making it to school today. But when my feet hit my feet hit the ground, my heart rate started to skyrocket, 120, 150 beats per minute. Wow! And so this is when I knew, okay, something's really wrong. And it led then to two years of seeing over 20 different specialists. So this thing did this thing didn't go away. It didn't go away. That was the issue. So before. You, I mean, I grew up on Z-Packs, you know, erythromycin. I grew up on amoxicillin. You just take that, you get better in a couple of weeks. What happened was there was no fix for this. Whatever it was, they said to me that you're either have you're going to have to get worse, or it will eventually go away on its own. We know something's wrong with you. We don't know what it is, because in conventional medicine, which I'll talk about, and I love conventional medicine, so I don't want to be, you know, put in this box where I'm against it. I'm not. I believe in conventional medicine for acute-based care, and I'm very happy that we have that. However, for chronic-based illnesses, it can't help you with any of those things. It's not meant to. It can mask symptoms, but I didn't even have symptoms that they could mask. So what happened was then I eventually looked into this thing called functional medicine. And again, 20 years ago, almost unheard of. But I ran the, one of the, it's funny because one of the same lab tests I ran today, a saliva based hormone test, found out I had something wrong with producing glucocorticoids, which is cortisol. Took it back then to my specialists and they said, okay, 
let's run an ACTH stem test. So in, in conventional medicine, you run that for Addison's disease. After that, they found out I had Addison's disease. I had type 2 diabetes because I failed a glucose tolerance test. And then I had autoimmune-based issues. I had POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia. That explained the high heart rate upon standing. And so now, finally got the diagnosis I was looking for. But what I later realized was that I wasn't going to get better. That was the whole thing. I was going to be medicated. I was taking the Cortef. I was taking the Flornef, all of these things. And I did feel better. But at 18, 19, 20 years old now, I didn't want that to be the rest of my life. Right. Right. Being on all these medications. That was it. And that's because it was artificially stimulating my body. And the more I looked into it, meaning like we were just starting to get online in the year was around 2000, uh, is like, I can't be on these things. It's going to lead to this, this, and this. And I was already sick as it was. And I wanted to get my life back. So the problem was, I mean, I was playing three sports in high school and, you know, National Honor Society, all these things. And I end up with brain fog. I end up not being able to play a pickup basketball game in college with my buddies because I would be sick the next day with flu-like symptoms, something called myelagic encephalomyelitis. We're literally... Yeah, it's, it's like a chronic fatigue syndrome. I interviewed Dr. Uh, Sarah Myhill about it. Exactly. It's chronic fatigue syndrome, but so deep that chondria can't produce the energy. They just sit there and bathe in lactic acid. And it's brutal. And it's like just doing a hill sprint, feeling like you're at the top of that hill. Um, and it's so it's, it's crushing. And there was no way out of it. That was the issue. So my job then was literally I made it my job to start to just read every book I can get my hand on. And then online, you know, Internet came about. So then I'm reading all these different articles and research. And finally, I met a doctor when I was around 24 years old, who put it all together for me. And I'll be forever grateful to Dr. Pete. Dr. Who? Uh, Dr. Margaret Pete. So how'd you meet her? Well, so I'm, I'm a big reader like yourself. I read her book and it just, con for whatever reason, it's a random book, but I connected with it. I contacted her. She's in her like late 60s, early 70s. And I go to Maine and I just literally took a bus to Maine. I was like, again, like 22, 23 years old, however old I was. And for, again, she just brought together Ayurvedic medicine, which I had touched on a little bit, functional medicine and genetics all together. So orthomolecular medicine, functional medicine, basically the same thing. Genetics and then pulling into Ayurvedic medicine. When I got all of those three working together, everything came together in my body. The life started to come back. And then that this is what I wanted to do. I said, okay, conventional medicine couldn't do this. So let me look outside of the United States. So I went back to school, but I said, I want to make sure that I do my internships, my residencies overseas. So here, this is my thought philosophy. I'm going to practice medicine, but I'm only going to practice the form of medicine that gets people better. And everybody, I mean, I don't know, I know that you talk to so many people, everybody believes their form of medicine is the best in the world, right? Like who's a health practitioner who practices homeopathy or acupuncture or chiropractic or, you know, whatever, Bach flower, and doesn't say it's the best in the world. Of course it is. So here's the deal though. I said, I want to see who truly is the best in the world. I want to live in these clinics. I want to work with the patients, see who gets better, be there long enough to see that they get well. And so that's what I did. That was my quest. I studied in Sri Lanka and India and China and Europe and all over the US. And I said, okay, let's see who gets people better. And, and I came at it from an un, unbiased perspective. Where'd this Dr. Pete, sorry to interrupt, learn, learn everything that, that she knew? So she studied um, naturopathic medicine. So she was an ND, but she went to then do her subspecialty at the Institute for Functional Medicine, which is the same exact thing I did as well, go there afterwards. But then she studied under, and again, this is just such serendipitous, like how does this happen? Who, who knows? Like how, how will I ever know how I got so lucky? But she studied under Dr. Vazantlad. Vazantlad came over here from India and is the foremost or was the foremost Ayurvedic doctor in the United States. He essentially brought Ayurveda to the United States. She studied under him and she wrote his textbooks. I mean, it's so crazy to think about it. She wrote his textbooks. So that was that. And I just said, okay, I need to get deeper into this medicine. If, if anyone's ever heard of it or studied it, it truly translates to the science of life. It is the basis for all forms of medicine today. A lot of what we rediscover today is literally a rediscovery of Ayurvedic medicine. And when I was over there in India, there's actually pharmaceutical reps or pharmaceutical scientists from almost every company in the Himalayas studying the herbs, working with the Vedas, working with the Ayurvedic doctors to see if they can patent these specific 
herbs into drugs. And they've done that. I mean, we know that because a statin comes from the same extracts as red yeast rice. Like these things are being done every day. And so it's, it's amazing to look back, keep an open mind and see what you can discover. So why do you call it a 6,000 year old secret? Is that just how old some of these Ayurvedic techniques were that you were looking into? So that's right. So the oldest Ayurvedic um, recorded history essentially is said to be from 6,000 uh, years ago. And then it's been handed down, handed down, further refined. And and that's what we see essentially today is, is uh, again, the one, one thing that I talk about, we have this thing called manual lymph drainage or the Vodder technique. It was discovered, and that's in air quotes, in the 1930s by Dr. Emanuel Vodder. And it's great. Like, so nothing against him. But Abhyanga, which is the form of Ayurvedic massage to drain the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system is four times the fluid of all of your blood in your body. It's the, it's the system that nobody ever talks about, and it's how we begin to really cleanse the body. I mean, all the interstitial fluid, the milieu of the body needs to go somewhere. Those, every cell breathes, and those toxins have to go somewhere, and they go to the lymph. So in Ayurveda, one of the main parts of detoxification is moving that lymph, and that was done 6,000 years ago. Wow. Okay. I, you, you have a bunch of stuff about moving the lymph. Like I, I love a lot of the practical techniques you have in the book and I want to dive into those. Uh, but first, why do you call it the rain barrel effect? Where, where did you come up with this? So the rain barrel effect is not something that I came up name wise, although it's, it's very little talked about, meaning that it does exist in the literature, but almost as like an afterthought. So I was a really, again, really sick kid. I had allergies. I had all these different things going on. So I'm in my immunologist's office and I pick up this, this literature, this research, and it talks like just in passing about this thing called the rain barrel effect. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of an interesting, you know, catch right there. And what it says literally changed the way that I looked at illness and it changes the way that I look at it today, but everything, it's just, it's about weight gain. It's about fatigue. It's about brain fog. It's about sickness, all of these things and the way that we age. So we all talk about genetics and genetics are important. I mean, I run full genetic panels, all that, but they're not as important as people think, meaning that it's epigenetics. It's our ability to turn on and off the genetics that really matters. And that's why, you know, you can, we all know people who are 75 years old, you know, they, they have had two drinks, they've smoked every day of their life, they exercise, they get up at 4.30, they need like six hours sleep. Well, they have phenomenal genetics, that matters. But some people, they do that same thing and at 25, they're wiped out. Well, what happens is we all have this rain barrel. And as we go through life, every minute, hour, month of our year, we're filling that up more so than ever before because there's 77,000 plus man-made chemicals in the U.S., about 8,000 overseas in Europe. Well, as that fills up, we don't really feel it. That's the hard thing about this human body is we're really good compensators. But once it gets to the top, we start to feel the symptoms. And they're just like, okay, anxiety, poor sleep, a little sluggishness, some brain fog. All of a sudden, your rain barrel overflows. When it overflows, you say, how did I get rheumatoid arthritis? How did I get sarcoidosis? How did I get MS? How did I get Parkinson's? Well, it was happening every single day of every single month of every single year. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's it's like it's like me, dude. I I grew up on Papa Murphy's Take and Bake Pizza and Iceberg Lettuce and Kraft Macaroni and Cheese and Peanut Butter Captain Crunch and a gallon of 2% milk a day. But it wasn't until I was like maybe gosh, like 20 and I and I was I was bodybuilding and I'd switched to all these ABB bodybuilding protein shakes that were just, you know, like like chemicals in a can that I finally started to have health issues. But it took that long. I, my, my body, my amazing human body was just, you know, aside from the the acne, right? And and uh and and the, some of the skin issues that it seems that that teenage boys push out when they're eating a toxic diet. I didn't have that many issues. I I performed pretty well. Uh, until that point and then my body said okay that's enough i'm good and you know f fortunately i you know i i didn't kind of get hit as hard as you did but okay that that makes sense as far as the rain barrel effect i definitely experienced that um i want to i want to dive into some of the practical stuff that you talk about in the book and one of the first things that you talked about that i hadn't come across before was this idea and correct me if i'm pronouncing this incorrectly of pancha karma uh, and, and you, you get into this in the book uh, about the 6,000-year-old Ayurvedic techniques. And one of the first things that you describe is pancha karma, and this intrigued me. Can you get in, into all these things like abhyanga and vamana and virachana? I'm pretty good at my, my Indian, by the way. Um, <laughs> that, and, that's and, excellent. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And what all these pancha karma things are and how you found them. Yeah. 
No, I'd be happy to. And so this is one of the things that um, Ayurvedic medicine is um, literally, I would say, famous for, and that's because it's now well studied. So a lot of people look at these modalities, whether it's Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, Taoist medicine, whatever it might be, and they say, oh, well, you know, that was fine, but they didn't know this. They didn't know this. Well, the truth is they knew a lot of this, and they understood deeply how the body works. So Panchakam is meant to a literally empty your rain barrel. So if we want to talk about how do we get better, we're always talking about adding more to the body. So more vitamins, more minerals, more amino acids, more of all of these things. And I'm not against any of those. I totally agree. However, most of the time when people are very sick, you need to work by a subtractive method first. So you need to remove before the body can handle more because it's already overwhelmed. Everything is overwhelming the body. We don't lack for anything in this life. What we do now is have overages and toxicity. So what Panchakama means is five actions, and those five actions help to detoxify, cleanse, rejuvenate the body in both mind and body. Because one thing that I learned is this. So when I was overseas studying in all different countries, all different types of medicine, what I realized was that every form of medicine worked. You just need to know when to apply it with what person. So if you don't try to fit them into a particular box, you can always get them well. Everything is curable. I really believe that. And again, I don't use curable from the conventional medicine. I mean rebalance the body, allow the body to then heal itself. So what Panchakama aims to do is take some of the stress off of the body. So what we want to look at is that why, how does it do that? Well, Abhyanga is a special type of massage. And the massage is typically done with two therapists, although you can just do it with one. And what it does is it drains the lymphatic system. So that means very light pressure, one millimeter to three millimeters right below the skin, and we're just moving that lymph. And the lymph is then moving from the ankles to the knee, the knee to the groin, all the way up to basically the left part of the chest where it's going to drain back out of the body. And so here's the thing. We have the abhyanga that gets the toxins mobilized. We're using something called varechana or varechan. And what that means is that now starts to soften the bile in the liver. And why is this important? Well, because your liver is filtering all of the blood in your body every six minutes, literally every ounce of all the blood in your body every six minutes. And what we want to do is then take all of those toxins that's being filtered by this thing like a car filter or a vacuum. When you vacuum your house, you need to empty that. Okay, it's very, very important. It was important 6,000 years ago. It's even more important today. So that's removing what's called the pitta or the excess heat of the body, the toxins. Vamana is something that we don't do in the U.S. So we don't use vomit in the U.S. because it's actually purgation or it's, it's actually having someone throw up. And there's a reason for this. Really? I, I'm pretty sure we have that in the U.S. It's called bulimia. Yes, and that's, that's, uh, that's a different form. We'll put it that way. This form looks to bring mucus to the mucus of the body, the people with the bronchitis, the congestion, all of those things, bring the mucus to the stomach and then get them to vomit up all of that mucus. And so we take patients through this. And uh, Basti would be... No, you, you can't, you, you can't just, just basically skim over that, dude. You're, you're actually <laughs> you're taking your patients and you're making them vomit. Yes. How do so you do is, that? So what we would do, and this is, um, this is in India and Sri Lanka, is we would give them milk, lots of milk. This would be part of an overall treatment. So usually you're leading up to this. Panchakama, you can do it in a day or two days, but usually it's over a course of about three weeks or so. And so you're, you're preparing the body for all of these different things. And before I could actually work with patients overseas, I would work in the back room and I would actually create these, they're called medicated decoctions. And it has basically herbal infused oils and we're using certain herbs, whether it's to decrease mucus, um, anything heating, mustard seed, uh, trichotu, pepper, any of those things would get rid of this, this phlegm. Well, what we do is we would give the person milk on an empty stomach. This would be done earlier in the morning because kapha, time of the day, is essentially between 6 and 10. And we would allow that mucus because milk – causes mucus. And a lot of people still don't believe this. I see kids with ear, nose, and throat issues, tonsillitis, all these things. And I grew up this way, drinking cold milk with like American chop suey at night. You know, it's the worst combination ever. And I had all sorts of, you know, ear infections, all those things. Well, mu mucus is caused also by drinking a lot of milk. So we'd bring it to the stomach. The milk would also cause people to vomit. But then typically what we would do is we would give them a salt water drink. And the salt water would then cause them to uh, vomit up all of this excess milk, but you would just see the thick. Was mucus it? Was it? Up. Were you using like a special kind of milk or just any milk? Well, over in India, we were just using normal, like grass-fed, you know, milk. That was it. Just normal milk. Yeah. Okay. It. All right. Got it. And then this one wasn't as as fancy. Now you're doing that 
after you've already brought people through, and and this 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 throwing up thing is called vimana, or purging, as you say. But before that, you you're cutting down from any animal tissue meat, and then you're also doing this this abhyanga massage, which is like the the lymph massage. And after you've done those first two steps of the panchakarma, doing the lymphatic massage and making sure someone's on this special diet, then you start to have them throw up. That's correct. So this is the the special diet is typically something called kitchari, and that would always be part of it, which was the the rice, the split mung beans, which is called dal and yeah, ghee. Yeah, mung beans are interesting. I've actually heard another pretty smart guy who's been going around talking about his detox protocol, like a ten day detox protocol. Um, Oh gosh, I'm blanking on his name. He he podcasts with some of my friends over at the the Nourish Balance Thrive Show. Uh, Doctor, um, uh, um, I'm totally blanking on it. I should have purged before the call. I'll I'll remember it in a minute. But anyways, so but before you do this vimana, how many days are you on the special diet, and how much of this lymph massage have you done? So the the lymph massage is daily. And that the diet will have been done for at least a week before. And so what you're doing is you're actually preparing your body for this cleansing. It's a ritual. It's a beautiful, beautiful ritual. Now, keep in mind, not everyone has to do this vomita, but it's a big part of it. Meaning like if you want the full panchakama, you want to do this. This is a longevity-based treatment. Um, very, very important in Ayurvedic-based longevity protocols. The yogis would do it. But the, the kitchari itself, I mean, the, the research on uh, dal and mung beans is, is phenomenal for in terms of removing microbes in the gut, using the ghee to help chelate heavy metals, and hmm. then also um, use the, the FOS, the fructooligosaccharides, to start to rebuild beneficial gut bacteria. So that, it's, that's it's all part common. of the diet, the, the ghee, the fructooligosaccharides, and things like mung beans and lentils, and then uh, the, the lack of the animal tissue meat. Exactly. And you would still include some fruit, but yes, you would have all of that in there. It's very, very just purifying. Just like you said yourself, you start to get sick when you increase protein. That's how it is for most people. If you look at the blue zones, if you look at anything, the higher protein you go. No, I didn't start to get sick when I increased protein. I started to get sick when I increased protein from these like chemical whey protein shakes. Agreed. From from more hazardous space forms. Right. I agree. Yes, exactly. And because what happens too is it, it just it's harder for the body to also process. And if you have any type of intestinal permeability, it's those larger amino acid strands. It's those greater uh, amount of proteins coming through the gut wall that can yeah. also then start to. Yeah. Although some people would argue also, you know, along with that, fats can cause some of these lipopolysaccharides to to cause toxicity as well in somebody with a with a leaky gut. Like it's kind of a protein fat one two combo in a way. Completely agree, which yeah. is why the kitchari is lower on, on all of those things, meaning that if the bacteria already exists in the gut and you're taking in the high fats from a keto base or, or saturated fats are essentially what we're looking at, mm -hmm. then it will help draw that right through the gut wall. So, yeah, okay. completely agree on that. Okay, so we've got we've got the, the first uh, three steps are abhyanga, which is the lymph massage, the special diet, and then vimana. It's, it's so weird. You don't see this a lot in, in Western medicine where, where you're actually – Doing doing emesis, you're, you're vomiting to remove the mucus from the upper respiratory tract uh, to like cleanse the body from from that hole. Uh, and then what's the next step? So the next step is the um, varicina, which I'm not sure if I mentioned that. That's the loosening of the bile in the liver, and you're giving people laxatives so that they're having three, four, or five bowel movements a day. And the reason is that your liver is then emptying into your colon, which we'll just talk about in a moment. So we, were, we would create herbal de decoctions, they're called. So essentially, you'd wake up every morning, and I would sometimes be the person that would run around to all these different patient rooms and put a bottle, like a liquid bottle of your herbal decoction with your medicated capsules. And we knew actually, it was really interesting. I got to make the actual capsules, the medication we called it, and you would roll it in either ghee or raw honey. And we use ghee or honey as a delivery method to actually get these things into the body and to a deeper level. So that was pretty amazing. And then you would use basti, which is an enema, again, a medicated enema. We would use herbs to remove waste from the colon. So it was, it was like a symphony. We would remove it from the upper respiratory tract, which is called kapha, or like the endomorphic type, the heavier body type. Pitta is in the liver, so we would release those toxins and bile down into the colon, and the colon then is reserved for vata, and we would release all the toxins that were dumped in the colon then into, obviously, a toilet. Now, um, the last part is, is the facial area. And the facial area has to do with something called nausea. And nausea is an amazing treatment for people with allergies. Okay, I'm going to slow you down again, man. I'm going to slow you down again. This, this virachana. 
where you induce multiple bowel movements in the form yes. of loose stool. How are you doing that? So we're using products such as Trifla. So Trifla is one of the mainstays that we would use. Now, we would use other things too because we'd be checking in with the patients on a daily basis. And if they weren't getting the results that we wanted, we increased dosage. And we were able to do that until we got the at least three bowel movements per day. Because it's very important as you're releasing toxins. So we were also – so when we had people on the special diet, we were also oxidizing body fat. A lot of people came to these clinics to lose weight as well. So – when they're there and you're oxidizing body fat, we have to keep in mind that body fat, adipose tissue, is about 300 times more toxic than your blood, meaning that your body does a really good job when toxins come into the blood. It's storing them in adipose tissue, and that adipose tissue can swell. And that's why a lot of people, sure, they're, they're overweight, but their body is swollen. They look puffy. And that's because those fat cells are also holding toxicity. And with that comes water as well. So we're oxidizing body fat. The toxins are coming to the blood. They're moving to the liver, hopefully not as much in the kidneys, and then we're then eliminating those into the colon then into, the, obviously, the toilet. Does this triphala herb, is this something you just take right before and it induces a bowel movement? Do you take it the night before, or how does it work? So triphala is a very uh, gentle laxative. And, the, and that's and T-R-I-P-H-A-L-A. So okay, by the way, for those of you listening, and I'll, I'll link to all this stuff. If you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash rain, I'll take some show notes here um, to, to Stephen's book and some of these weird herbs we're talking about. Yes. And so one thing I want to say, too, is that a lot of we, so Trifla is one of the mainstays of Ayurveda, meaning like that is a great product on how it feeds beneficial back, uh, gut bacteria, how it keeps the bowels moving. You can take it directly after every meal. Uh, we had people start the day with a stronger formula so they would have a bowel movement first thing in the morning. A lot of people coming in constipated. We need to get the bowels moving so they're not reabsorbing toxins back into their body. Um, so again, I just want to, I want to uh, preface this with, this is what I learned. This is not a lot of what I'm doing in my practice today. Meaning like I'm not putting people through, um, you know, Basti's and, and making you, people throw up my practice. You have like, you have like a modern protocol, probably the one I did yes, yesterday. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you're not having your patients do this, but you did it when you were over there in India. Correct. I did it myself, um, many times. What was that like to, to do, to do the throwing up part? The throwing up was the well, it was the second hardest. Believe it or not, there's something else. There's another treatment called Jalaneti, which is essentially cleansing of the nasal passages. And I have this brutal deviated septum. So you you it's almost like flossing for your nasal passages. You literally put up this rubber thing and you pull it through both sides of your nose. That's that's next level right there. So that was intense. Uh, the second hardest thing was the throwing up. And that was because I'm someone who's just I produce more mucus. And, and that was Again, growing up, I can talk about that. But one of the ways that I filled up my rain barrel was that I took 3,000 capsules of amoxicillin from the ages of 14 to 17. And I had mild acne. Again, that boy with a bad diet, just like you, drinking Kool-Aid and eating little Debbie snacks every day. And took uh, antibiotics for three years. That was it. And so that wiped out my gut flora, ended up with SIBO and all these different things. Well, what happened was doing these treatments really helped me eliminate a lot of this mucus from my body. So although, although it was a brutal treatment, it helped tremendously to get all of that up. I felt so much lighter. That's actually the biggest thing people say is when they go through panchakama, when they go through a detoxification protocol, their head is so much clearer. They feel so much lighter. Wow. Okay. So this, this nasal thing, you didn't talk about that in the book, did you? I did. It's called nausea. N-A-S-Y-A. Nausea. N-A-S-Y. Okay. Nausea. Yeah. That, that was where you put the, the Ayurvedic herbal oil and the and the Let's. facial massage to open up the sinuses it's kind of funny i did i i had an amazing amount of energy the past week i did something possibly kind of similar when i was at the a doctor's office down in salt lake city a couple days ago where this guy shoved the balloon up my nose uh dr craig bueller and he did like a nasal i, I posted to my facebook page if you if you guys go over there Actually, you know, I'll just put a link in the show notes. It's like an eight-minute long video where he shoved the balloon up my nose and cracked all of the bones in my sinuses to open them up and did that four times in, in each, uh, each nostril to open up the nasal passages and crack some of the skull, uh, the, what do they call them, the, the skull sutures. It was mind-blowing in terms of how I felt with clear headedness when I sat up from having that procedure done. So it's probably a lot different than this, this steam inhalation that you did with this nausea, but uh, I, I get it. A lot of people don't think about all the crap that builds up, up in your nasal passages. Yeah. Unless someone's doing this type of treatment, which this is the most benign of them. I mean, it's really, and it's phenomenal too. You're essentially lying back 
we're adding drops to someone's uh, nasal passages and they're sucking up and they ha- you have to suck up to get it into the nasal passages. And when you look at your sinuses, they're above the eyes essentially and, and right below the eyes. And what we need to do is bacteria can get in there. Now, the interesting thing is if you take antibiotics, like let's just say amoxicillin for a sinus infection, your recurrence of a second sinus infection is almost 100%. And the reason is we always talk about our gut flora. Well, you change your nasal flora as well. There is actually bacteria that's meant to be in the nasal passages, the sinus as well. What the nausea does is it helps to kill any of the yeast that may be there, any of the bacteria that's there, helps to rebalance those passages. And then the steam loosens everything. After that, the stuff that comes out of your sinuses is unbelievable. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show. I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about uh, this milk that I drink each night. And no, it's not cow's milk. It's golden milk. So I get it uh, from this company called Organifi. And what they do is they throw the anti-inflammatory spice turmeric in there, which has over 8,000 different published studies and articles that show its numerous health benefits. But more importantly, it tastes wonderful when you combine it as they do with smooth coconut milk cinnamon ginger lemon balm and they put uh, some reishi in there a couple of other mushrooms that make it this warm relaxing beverage i like to blend it i i boil myself some water i pour it over a couple of scoops of this organifi gold sometimes i'll toss some other things in there like a little bit of cbd oil or you know a few drops of melatonin and i blend it all up and make this amazing nighttime relaxation beverage So it's called Organifi Gold, made by the same people who also do Organifi uh, Green Juice, Organifi Red. What they've managed to do is just shove a whole bunch of organic superfoods in powdered form into these bottles with no juicing and no mess and no cleanup for you. Just this jar that you open up and you dig in the scoop and you put it in whatever you want to put it in. Uh, Even my kids really like this Organifi Gold stuff and they make smoothies with the Organifi Red and the Organifi Green. I feel like I'm saying Organifi a lot because I am. Spell it with an I though. Organifi with an I. Uh, You go to Organifi.com. The discount code Greenfield automatically saves you 20%. How do you like that? Use code Greenfield at Organifi.com to save 20%. This podcast is also brought to you by elk, not an actual elk, but by elk meat. Uh, There's a company that makes elk protein bars, elk protein bars. So they partnered up with Native American Natural Foods and created this delicious elk meat bar that also has bison and bacon in it. So you get 21 grams of organic gourmet protein. They uh, enhance the flavor by slow smoking this stuff with genuine hickory chips. They use an ancient Lakota recipe to make these bars. Uh, Elk has more protein, by the way, than chicken or beef. It's very high in B vitamins and iron and zinc. And one of my favorite guys, President Teddy Roosevelt, he was actually a big fan of of hunting elk. Uh, And it's antibiotic-free, it's steroid-free, it's hormone-free. How can you get your hands on a box of these bars? Well, you get a discount, 10% discount on them when you go to Onnit at Onnit. Uh, BenGreenfieldFitness.com slash O-N-N-I-T, where you can get elk bars and cashew butter and wonderful salt, all sorts of stuff. Save 10% off of any purchase at Onnit. Go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com slash O-N-N-I-T. Okay, so you have the lymph massage, the special diet, the Vamana, which is the the phlegm that builds up within your upper respiratory tract that you get rid of by by drinking the milk and then, then vomiting that back up. You have the uh, the varicina, which you said is is like the the purgation that that's like when you use the triphala or, or other herbs to induce a bowel movement. Then you have this this basti, which is the uh, the enema that would come, uh, I, I guess, in the form of like a you know like a medicated enema to induce a bowel movement, similar to the way that we do a coffee enema these days. And then this nausea to, to clean out the sinuses. And those are those are like all the steps of the panchakarma detoxification. That's right. And then typically you'll do an add on like the Shiradhara, which is the application of oil in the middle of the forehead. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll do a sweating like the Svedana, uh, which, which allows again. So what you're looking to do is essentially wring out the body. Hmm. I mean, that's what you're looking to do. And, yeah. and so the Svedana is the sweat, and that's a huge part of it. I, I want to ask you about the Svedana, but has anybody ever studied this to see if it actually works? Like, like measured like pre and post metals or toxins or anything like that? Absolutely. And so that was my big thing is even though 
I'm studying this, but I still have a Western mindset. I still have a mindset of someone who's looking at the research. Does this work? Does not work? Because, I mean, I'm seeing the people get better, but I'm like, okay, well, you know, what's exactly is going on? So then I go back and I dig into the research. I find this book called Ayurvedic, um, what, what's it called? Ayurvedic Therapies and Ayurvedic Healing. It's like a 700 page book. And all it goes through is the scientific research. It's amazing. And then I said, okay, well, let's look at Panchakama because there's a lot of places like the Maharishi Institute in the United States that will do it as well. And so when I look at it, I'm looking at the, the research. It shows that typically when you, you – on your day-to-day, -day, you're, you're just eating well. You're doing like you know a vegetarian-based diet, whatever it might be, right? Is you're only going to lose – you're only going to drop about 1 percent it shows of like heavy metals and other toxins in your stool, in your sweat, any of these things. Well – Panchakama was specifically studied after a 14-day protocol. So this is a full like 7 to 14-day protocol. They found that PCBs and other pesticides from the environment as well as heavy metals were reduced in the blood by 50%. And I can quote this study as well. I believe this was done by the University of Colorado. So I'll, I'll see if I can send that over to you for the show notes page as well. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, de definitely send me the study. I'll link to that in the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash rain uh, for all you people who, who need convincing through science. Uh, anyways, though, that convincing through science, they need to drink milk and throw up and shove stuff up your nostrils. Uh, anyways, though, so you, you mentioned briefly just a second ago, Svidana. And this was kind of cool. This is what I liked about your book because you went, you went into the fascinating history of not just how to do this Svedana, but then you, you really got into the fascinating history of heat in general. Can you describe the, the practice Svedana and how it's used in Ayurvedic medicine and, and how it purportedly works? And then, uh, and then I want to dive into heat therapy in general. Sure. So um, with the Svedana, what, what you're doing is you're doing the Abhyanga. Okay? So you're, you're doing something that is allowing you to always mobilize the toxins, remove the toxins. Now, the only people we wouldn't, so Svetana would be a, usually a steam. You would get into literally a box. You would sit in a box. It looks a lot like the lower cost units for the infrared sauna, but it, you're, they're blowing steam into a wooden box. Or you would lie down in the box. And you would always have your head out. And I want to I want to talk about that actually in a couple minutes of why they always took the head out of the box of, of uh, not allowing steam to get to the head. Because I think that's one of the ways that we're going wrong with, with heat now, but we'll talk about that. Um, and so what you would do is you'd find one more way for the toxins to remove, to get out of the body. So we can eliminate through, through urine, uh, stool. We can eliminate them, huff them out through the lungs. Not as easy that way, but you can. And then also through the skin, being the largest excretory organ in the body. So what we would look to do is just purify, get those out of the body. And uh, essentially, you'd go in there for only about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes max. You would leave drenched. I don't, like it was unbelievable the amount of heat that your body would um, accumulate and essentially then squeeze out the body, squeeze these toxins out. So we'll go into the science in just a moment. The one thing that we have to be careful of, I think, nowadays with steam, and, and it's because we're going into steam rooms, and this is like an important caveat whenever I talk about steam, and they're not, it's not water filtered. Meaning that yeah. you're just breathing in chlorine vapors. I know that always that always concerns me. As a matter of fact, I, I brought my kids down to this Pocan Club a couple of weeks ago because we wanted to go swimming, and uh, we walked into the steam room. And one of my, it was pretty funny because there were like two guys in there, and they cracked up laughing. One of my kids goes, "Do you think there's much mold in here?" And uh, then my other boy River says, "Dad, the water that they put in here that we're breathing in, do you know if it's clean?" And so, so they're like super cognizant about this stuff, but it's amazing how many people go to these fancy health spas and not take into consideration whether or not they're filtering the water that you're sucking in and bathing yourself in, in the steam room. And that's awesome that your, your kids are saying that, but that's the truth. Meaning that you are absolutely doing more harm than good if you go in a steam room that you don't know where the water's been filtered because the chlorine is now a vapor. And that vapor just goes directly through the lungs right into your bloodstream. So I can't recommend that at all. Uh, use the sauna instead. So we use the sauna as well um, in India, Sri Lanka for the sweat-based treatment to, again, move these, these – and there's great research behind this. So, again, using a sauna uh, to remove heavy metals and toxins from the body. But uh, the reason we use the sauna in often cases was that anyone with joint-based issues such as rheumatoid arthritis, we wanted more of the dry heat. Any, any mucus buildup, any kapha, we always wanted the drying heat rather than the wet heat. Okay. Got it. Got it. So the, this, this Svev, what'd you call it? Swedana. Can you buy some kind of thing that, that, that does this like a system or is it, 
is it like a box that you have to build? Like, like how can you actually use this if you don't want to go into a steam room at your local gym? Yeah, you can absolutely buy one. Um, I've seen them sold on Amazon. They're on Alibaba. And it really is just a wood box that you sit in on a little stool. And then you have the steam unit on the outside and you're just pumping it directly into that box. Okay. And again, the head always being exposed. Yeah. yeah my, so. my wife could use this. She gets a lot of kind of like nasal issues that sometimes lead to migraine. So I'm going to look this up. This is Fedana. Now, you, you get into just the fascinating history of of sauna and heat in general. Obviously on the show before, I've talked about, you know, giant sweat boxes and saunas and the idea behind saunas, but can you go through some of the timeline of the super fascinating stuff that you researched for this book because there was, I mean, every everything from like uh like palm healing that naturally produces these infrared rays like this old Chinese technique from 1000 BC to uh, you know, obviously we know about Finland, but there were other people that you get into as well, like even way back in the Stone Age. I find this fascinating. Can you kind of kind of detail what you discovered as far as the the forgotten history of sauna? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things is um, it always comes from first we look into the research and I say, OK, great, it works. But then I'm like, have they ever done this before in the past? So what I don't want is just the knowledge from the last year or two. Like, that's fine. But I don't want anybody in my practice to certainly be a guinea pig. And I also want to look at how do they use it, you know, a thousand years ago or even just maybe a hundred years ago, whether it's Herbert Shelton taking people out and fasting them and doing cold baths and saunas and all of these things. But then you begin to look into it and you say, wow, they had literally dug holes in the ground and put animal skins over them since the Stone Age all the way through like, I don't know, a thousand BC. It was amazing. And then it got more advanced. So then you would see, again, what you're talking about um, more is, is Chinese-based healing where you're using things like Reiki or polarity-based methods and, and their belief that the infrared rays, the same rays that you would look at from the sun, if you believe that you're made up of the same constituents of everything on Earth, they're saying that there's the same magnetic-based uh, residents. And again, I don't know that I believe in that because I always, again, look to the science first. However, there's something to this. Whenever you look at detoxification-based protocols and you look at sauna and why were people doing this since at least we can see recorded history, whether it's cave drawings or just that we find in terms of ruins, there's something to this. And it went all the way up to then uh, somewhere around, I would say, 1500, 1600, where we started to see it more in the Finnish-based sauna that we know today brought over to the United States. One of the more interesting things I will say is this, is I got the um, experience to go down to Tulum, Mexico, where the Mayans have these amazing things. I, used to th I believe they used to be called uh, Temescales, or they're called uh, Temescales. Yeah. Or temescales. Yeah, I've been, I've been down there. It's a creepy place. Where they <laughs> chop people's heads off and do human sacrifice. You can like feel it in the air. It's weird. My wife and I both visited, and we were walking around. My wife's like... This is creepy. It feels creepy. And I, I told her, yeah, I, I kind of feel this weird sensation too. Uh, but but maybe their saunas weren't that creepy. What were you going to ask me? Have, have you done one of them before? What's that? The Temezcal saunas, the big huts that they have? Uh, I've done something very similar to that, like, like a giant hut Indian sweat lodge type of thing up in Canada. And then I've done the, the traditional Native American teepees and, and the Finnish sauna. But I haven't done the, the Temezcal in Mexico. So very similar, the, the, the teepee um, that they would create with the, with the hides, you would bring in the hot rocks and you would pour the water over it. This is almost a hybrid of like a steam and a sauna because you're creating the heat. There's not as much moisture. Well, they, they literally have this stone hut. Uh, and it's, it's remarkable. It's a two-hour ceremony. So first you're, you're heating up the stones, you're bringing them in, and it's four, meaning like the four uh, quadrants of the earth. You are bringing in four different ones, each for a half hour. By 90 minutes, I was like literally ready to pass out. But you get out of there feeling like you've sweat out five pounds, which I'm sure you have, and much more clear. It's, it's really, there's a lot of ritual that goes along with these things. And that's what I found as well. They were never just done for purification of the body. They were also done for purification of the mind. That's oh, one yeah. of the things I think I've forgotten. Absolutely. My Indian sweat lodge ceremony was intense. I mean, we were inside of this giant teepee with blankets and we heated the rocks over a fire all night. And it was kind of cool. It was at this father-son wilderness camp called the Twin Eagles Wilderness Camp uh, over in um, near uh, Post Falls, Idaho. And we all sat in there inside this teepee for round after round of these hot rocks being placed right in the center of the teepee, pitch black, extremely claustrophobic. And uh, 
there was a uh, like a drum beat going while we sat in there getting us up to a frenzy and a few of the guys just freaked out and ran out and couldn't take it anymore but it was it was a very very intense heat slash claustrophobic slash spiritual experience you know it wasn't just like sitting in the sauna reading men's health magazine with your nuts hanging out a towel like you would do at a, at a health club so yeah there's, there's a very spiritual uh sacred aspect to a lot of these heat therapies same thing exactly with the Mexican experience. We were, we were chanting the whole time. We had no idea what we were chanting, but it's also echoing through this entire chamber. If you get the experience to be able to do that, I just highly recommend it. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you, you go into in the book, and, and by the way, folks, you should definitely get this book. There's, there's even more on the fascinating history of hyperthermia in the book, including the use of infrared. And you're a fan of infrared as a detoxification protocol? I am. Uh, and that's, I think, one more modality that you can use. And I don't think that everyone has to get kind of caught up in, in which one, but it's one more thing to add to your arsenal. And one of the reasons why I'm really big on the sauna is because the research right now, and um, you probably have seen this yourself, the research shows, and this is done on a 21-year study, over 2,300 Finnish men, that you can decrease your risk for a sudden cardiac death by 63% by simply doing 19 minutes in a sauna four to seven times a week. That's it. Four to seven times a week, 19 minutes decreased sudden cardiac death by 63%, but it also decreased all-cause mortality by 40%, wow. meaning all causes of death were decreased if you stayed in a sauna 19 minutes for four to seven times a week. If there was ever a pharmaceutical drug that could possibly mimic this, it would be a trillion-dollar drug. There's nothing like it. I think it's absolutely incredible, and infrared can add to that. Where was this study? Um, let me see if I, I can get I was just curious if it was the same one I was thinking of from Finland. Uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, when I had her on my show, was talking about the study in Finland where they, where they had longevity. If you can't, if you can't find it right now, that's fine. I'll yeah. uh, just send it to me later along with that other study and I'll, I'll link to it, uh, in the show notes, by the way, uh, going back to that doctor, I couldn't remember his name was Dr. Brian Walsh, this guy who I've heard on, on a few other shows and who I've spoken with in the past, who does use very similarly things like mung beans for the, uh, I believe you called them the, the fructo oligosaccharides, Stephen? Correct. And, and that's, and just a little caveat, remove the candida or SIBO first, and then you can use those. Mm, for sure. That makes sense. Okay. So you'd want to make sure that if you're, if you're dumping fructo oligosaccharides in your system, that you remove candida. So you're not feeding the bugs in your stomach. Exactly correct. Yeah. Okay. So you've taken all this stuff, this traditional pancha karma, uh, and you've, you've taken out the drink, a bunch of milk and puke, and instead kind of <laughs> turned it into a little bit more doable one, two, three detox protocol. So I decided that prior to interviewing you, uh, I would try out your protocol. And so the first thing that I did yesterday when I got out of bed in the morning was I hopped on this mini trampoline that I have downstairs and I started jumping up and down on the trampoline and this was supposedly to get the lymphatic fluid moving as step one. Talk to me about some of the methods you could use for lymphatic and how long you'd want to do that first step. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. You can do the the trampoline, the rebounder, any one of those things to get that lymph system moving. So there's not a lot meaning like your lymphatic system just sits there sluggish as you're lying down all night. It's not like the blood, which is just on an automatic pump that's moving. You need to manually move that. Heat can do it. It's one of the few things that can move your limb system without you actually moving, but really you're going to get the benefit from moving it manually. So the trampoline's a great one. The one that I still bring back from you know India, from my days over there, is doing a self-massage, whether you're doing dry brushing or whether you, you're using sesame oil. So usually the base uh, for a lot of these oils is sesame. And sesame is a little bit more heating Again, you want to move, you want to heat the body. That's really one of the best ways to get it, uh, to get that vasodilation and, and to get that, that blood pumping. So one of the things you can do is you can do that. It's just called, again, a lymphatic-based massage. You can look it up, super simple to do. But what you want to do is start to always stroke towards the heart, move towards the mm -hmm. heart, and that will allow you then to move that lymph. And that only takes five to 10 minutes maximum. I mean, that's yeah. really it. Honestly, it, it doesn't, it takes me like two to three minutes, dude. I have a dry skin brush on top of my sauna. And, and what I do is just grab it when I wander into my sauna. And I have some of that Ayurvedic sesame oil, too. I think it's the uh, Banya Botanicals sent me a bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, companies send me this stuff because they know I'm into detoxification. So I'll get, like, freaking enema kit boxes and showing up at my front doorstep unordered. Just surprise, like, 
Christmas, an enema Christmas. They every are day. authentic. So, yeah. so yeah, I, uh, I get the sesame oil and the dry skin brush. And this is kind of cool. Like, like if anybody's listening in, you have an infrared sauna or you have access to one, you put the, do you put the sesame oil on first? So I'm not 100% sure I'm doing this in the correct order, but I put the sesame oil on and then I go in the sauna with my skin brush and I just brush from my legs up to my heart and the arms up to the heart. So what I would do is do the dry brushing so that the skin is actually dry. And what happens is the dry brush stimula- stimulates the skin. And when people dry brush, a lot of times they go too hard. It's not meant to really exfoliate. What it's meant to do is just depress the skin about one to three millimeters. That's it. So a very, very small amount just to get that lymph moving. And also, like let's say someone has histamine-based issues, they have mastocytosis. The harder you brush, the more of a stimulus you're going to create, not something that ideally you want to do. Then what I would do is I would put on the sesame oil and then get into your sauna okay. uh, and just sweat it right out. Or I could like go in the sauna and do my dry skin brushing in the sauna and then just like open the door, grab the sesame oil, smear that on, and then get back in the sauna. You could combine it all for sure, as long okay. as you haven't started sweating yet, because you need the dry, the dry skin, the dry brush. Right, right, exactly. I could just yep. dry brush in the heat to to uh, to kind of accelerate my ability to sweat after I finish, just to kind of preheat. So I do my dry brushing while I preheat. So so anything that moves limp, like dry brushing, self massage. I did the rebounding. So what I did was I jumped up and down on the trampoline uh, for ten minutes, and while I was doing that, I had the sauna warmed up, and then I went in the sauna for about a half hour. Now, what's the idea behind doing the limp first and then the sauna after? Yeah, it's a great question. You always do want to make sure you're doing something even like the Suri Namaskar or any of those things just to just move that lymphatic system. The reason is that your cells, again, they're always removing waste and that happens all day long. So if it goes to the lymphatic system, you then want that lymph system to move. The faster it moves, the faster you can detoxify. And as you're moving the lymph, you can also sweat out some of those toxins. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. You always move the lymph before you get in the sauna. And when you're in the sauna, I like to just, the sauna for me is more like shutting down the sympathetic nervous system. I really just try to get into that, like, uh, low beta, like deep, deep theta state where I've got the binaural beats playing and I'm really getting into a parasympathetic based state where healing can truly take place. And one of the goals of an infrared sauna is to actually move you from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic where that healing does take place. So I try to just shut it all down. I know a lot of people like to do stretching, all of those things in the sauna. For me, it's more of a, a quiet time. Okay. Got it. I'm kind of the opposite, dude. I do like yoga and and uh, i do kundalini breath work and i do stretches but my heart my heart rate gets pretty high like my max heart rate is up around upper 190s and i'll get up into the 170s when i'm in the sauna but then sometimes i'll go in there in the evening and just do something very parasympathetic like a little foam rolling and sit back and read sometimes i'll bring like a a vape pen or you know just something kind of relaxing in there and just chill so for me it kind of depends uh, but ultimately, uh, the, the, the second step is to sweat things out once you've got the lymphatic fluid moving from something like the dry skin brushing or the trampolining or any of those, those elements from the first step. So we're trying to approximate Panchakarma without the, the puking and, uh, but, but with the enemas, because the third step, uh, because I went upstairs and I had already prepared my French press and it was already at room temp by the time I got out of the sauna. So I grabbed my stainless steel enema bucket because like a good little boy scout I, I didn't want to shoot plastics on my backside and i brought it in the bathroom and i followed your instructions to the t including after i put the all the coffee in from the bucket lying on my right side why do you lie on the right side what you're doing is you actually so you start off in your back you insert the tube into your anus about four inches or so and then what you're doing is you lie to your left side and then you roll to your right and you want to roll to your right to try to just work with gravity to move to your liver, which is under that right side of the rib cage, as fast as possible. And so what you're hoping to do is get that bucket to empty. You set it about three or four feet above the ground, and you allow the uh, organic coffee, of course, just like you said, enter the body. One of the big things about the the um, liver here is that the liver is typically filtering the blood every about every six minutes. Well, doing a coffee enema, you dilate, uh, you dilate the bile ducts, and you're also speeding up the transit time. So it's been shown, and again, now Gerson Research, Gerson Institute has a lot of research on this. So does Dr. Lawrence Wilson, of how you can speed it up to about every three minutes now. So you're, if you can keep that 
um, enema, meaning like in your body, the coffee enema, for anywhere between 12 and 15 minutes, you're getting somewhere between four and five passes through your liver of all the blood in your body. That is allowing your liver then, given that it can work on both phase one and phase two detox, to further detoxify the body. And then after you're done, you get right on the toilet and you eliminate all of those toxins. It is one of those things where people say, I want to do this every day, which typically we say, don't do it every day because it can start to uh, make your bowel movements a little less productive. You can lose a lot of minerals and electrolytes as well. Completely agree. So we don't we do this during a panchakama, but we certainly don't recommend it um, all the time. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, dude, I've I felt amazing. I've kind of gotten out of the habit of doing a regular coffee enema. I used to do them every week. I'd forgotten how amazing you feel. But interestingly, when I was at that that same guy who did that nasal balloon therapy that I mentioned earlier, he also did a palpation of my gallbladder and liver points and found them to be very tender and recommended that I do some gallbladder and liver cleanses and, and take some kind of a bile treatment. In addition, I got a live red blood cell analysis from a different doctor, Dr. Jason West, over in Pocatello, Idaho, and he noted the presence of of what are called ghost cells, which are cells that don't quite have the membrane they're supposed to because of some type of fat malabsorption. And he also mentioned that it was likely that my gallbladder and my bile production was a little bit messed up. So I'm actually planning for the next little bit on doing one of these coffee enemas every few days. And for me, it's, it's pretty simple. I make my normal cup of coffee, and then I have this side coffee that I use for the enema, and I just lay on my right side and, and get some work done on my phone while I sip my cup of coffee and just let the enema do its work. I stand up after 15 or 20 minutes use the restroom and dude i feel freaking glorious like on fire the rest of the day it is pretty amazing and it's honestly once you do it once it like it doesn't have the dramatic you know sign to sound to it that it that we're talking about it right now if you've never done it before it sounds like this really intense thing but just like you said you're lying on your right side you're reading a book you're on your phone you just get in the toilet and that's it like it's pretty benign for the most part and once a week uh, i think that's enough now in the beginning so keep in mind like when most natural anti-cancer based institutes they're doing four or five or even six of these a day and the reason is that they're dramatic so they're trying to kill tumors they're trying to break down all of these toxins and eliminate it as fast as possible because the liver, we've been talking a lot about the liver and lymphatic system. Well, the liver is the organ that if you need to heal your body, if you need to get well, you have to focus on it. The nutrients for phase one, the nutrients for the sulfur-based amino acids for phase two. And if you can help it along, that's all we're talking about is these treatments help along your natural detoxification-based system. But you could still do, because this is something I was thinking, just the way my mind works is, is it almost feels like I could be missing out on some of the steam bath stuff or some of the nasal stuff or like the upper respiratory tract mucus decongestion that you talk about with the traditional panchakarma. Uh, do you still implement any of those in your practice? Is that, I mean, I don't even know if it's legal to feed people milk and have them throw up at a medical clinic in the U S but do you work in any of these other protocols or have you found that this one, two, three detox protocol with the lymph massage, the sauna and the coffee enema to be just as effective for folks? Yeah, so most of what we do is traditional uh, functional medicine integrative-based work. So we're doing lab testing. So if someone comes in, we just refuse to guess what's wrong. We're, we're putting them through lab tests, whether it's organic acid testing, hormone-based testing, omega-3. We're doing all of that. We don't even worry about the genetics in the very beginning because we need to, we need to get the body back to homeostasis. So we're working on foundational-based things. Uh, when cell membrane dynamics is a big part of it because one thing that I found is, yes, reading all of these things, reading Dr. Emmanuel Ravici's work and Dr. George Watson and um, you know, Dr. Roger Williams, all these people's, you're looking at something called neuroendoimmunology. And Panchakama works with this, but how the nervous system affects the hormones, which then affects the immune system. And if you can master that, then the body is no longer bouncing all over the place. It starts to then be on this teeter totter. You get the positive and negative feedback loops back in order. When you do that, then you can say, okay, the body's stable. Let's take it to the next level. Let's begin to do these anti-aging based protocols. Let's look at telomeres. Let's look at genetics. Let's look at all these different foundational things and let's start to purify and detoxify the body. So the first thing we do is foundational and then we're getting people that quick win where they feel good. About 12 to 16 weeks, most people are going to be really back to normal for the most part is what I see. And then, then they can start to do these purifying um, type techniques. Because honestly, we try to meet people where they are, and most people aren't ready for these types of things right off the bat. And you, no, uh, making people throw up in, in the U.S. is not legal. 
Really? It's not. Okay. Just curious about that. Um, do you, uh, do you do this your whole life? Is this something that's just kind of like general health protocol, like brushing your teeth just once a week, you do your sauna and your dry skin brushing or your rebounding and finish up with your enema? So myself personally, I'm not doing the enema as often anymore. And, um, so I look at it like this in Ayurvedic medicine, you did big seasonal detoxes and I have, I, I have my own formulated detox, which is essentially liver detoxification. But whenever you say liver detoxification, it sounds like you're in rehab or something like that. So we don't, we don't call it that. Uh, what we do is, so is we're getting the liver ramped up. So that's part of our, our special diet, the Dr. Well detox, but then we're doing this every season. So we're making it a point for one week to go through as many of these treatments for one week as possible with every season. That's always how it was done. Because remember, in the winter, being on if if you're in Boston or you where you are and you're on a, like a cold raw vegan diet, it's it's horrible for your body. And I don't want to offend anybody, but yeah. it's not right for that season. I don't, don't want to eat raw mung beans in the snow. <laughs> exactly. So you're eating heating foods, but now when it comes to spring, you need to release that heat. And so then you do that, this detoxification, same thing with summer, same thing with fall. And so that's what I do is I really follow the seasonal and at least one big one a year. Intermittent fasting is a part of that for myself as well. And this is what I learned when I was overseas too, because what happened was all the Ayurvedic doctors, they would actually travel. You know, I was in a lot of functional medicine clinics in Europe as well. They would go to India and they would do these traditional, um, the big panchakama for a week or two once a year. Okay. Got it. Wow, man. This is pretty cool. I, uh, I personally, if anything from your book, learned a pretty cool one, two, three protocol that makes me feel like a million bucks. So thank you because I plan on repeating that a, a few times. Maybe even I'll do it once a week. I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very cool. And the book is chock full of a whole bunch of other detox history, sauna history. You get into a lot of like house cleaning protocols, water filtering protocols, personal care products, a lot of really great tips in the book. And I will link to it in the show notes uh, for anybody listening in. You just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash rain. I know that Dr. Steven has worked with over a quarter million clients and patients in his office. So he's got a lot of experience with this stuff. And if you're in or near the Boston area, you should Probably go see him if you have a, a little detoxification that you got to do or a health issue to clear up. So uh, in the meantime, Stephen, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing all this stuff with us, man. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, folks, I'm Ben Greenfield along with Dr. Stephen Cabral, author of The Rain Barrel Effect, uh, signing out. You can grab all the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash rain and have a healthy and amazing week. <laughs> You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice.